Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. Today, we're talking about Mr. Jacob trying, trying to play catch-up. Got him, got him a good one the other day. Got him a real nice buck. We're also going to hit some listener Q&As at the end of this podcast, so uh, y'all be looking out for those. I got uh, timestamps in the show notes if you want to skip ahead to those Q&As, and you just don't give a crap about Jacob's buck at all. You can you can skip ahead to those. Yeah. So, anyways, Jacob, you're doing pretty good, huh? Yeah, doing real good. Doing real good. Yeah, you say I'm playing catch-up, but in, in all honesty, um, I can't play too much catch-up because I only got one tag left in Alabama. So unless I go back to Arkansas or go back to Tennessee, um, you, might, you, might, you might outdo me this, this fall. Uh, that's what I'm trying to it, do. It might, be, it might be a reverse of last year. Yeah, it so. might be. It might be. <laughs> you might get you six bucks. Did I kill a buck? Yeah, I killed two bucks last or, year. Five bucks, actually. Yeah. I'm yeah, I killed. This year. Yeah. That's the max I could kill this year, mm-hmm. cause I, cause I ain't going back out of state. I don't know you could get your old bonus buck hunt somewhere. Yeah, you could, you could. I'm glad to see that they're moving some of those bonus buck hunts around. So in Alabama, we do bonus buck hunts on certain public lands. They'll have like one day of the season where you can go and kill a buck, and it doesn't count against your limit. Mm-hmm. And traditionally, they've done it at like pr- what, in my opinion, the worst time you could possibly go to kill a buck. Yeah. And they're they're starting to switch that up to where you you have a legitimate chance to go shoot a buck. Um, and so I'm glad to see they're doing that. As yeah. you'll hear in the story, it almost happened for me. Yeah, yeah, it almost did. And you know, like SOA hunt too, like that's not a bonus buck. Because yeah. we got an SOA hunt coming up. Special opportunity area, which is like yeah. Alabama's version of like quota hunts that they'll have for other pieces of public land. Kind of mm-hmm. like, you know, how Georgia specifically does theirs. Um, but yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. There's been a lot of people who say like, man, that ought to be a bonus buck hunt. But you know, Yeah, I, Michael I, Perry says that. And okay. I, I tend to agree. <laughs> I tend to agree. But anyways, all right. Um, so this past Saturday, let's see, we got back from Thanksgiving and everything, yeah. and uh, it was it was time, which traditionally, just around the places we normally hunt, uh, I feel like it's kind of a double whammy. Like, that weekend is really good because mm-hmm. it's it's kind of early, early, early rut. It's not, I wouldn't call it rut, but it's for sure pre-rut. They're fighting. They're grunting. Mm-hmm. They're doing their stuff. Little bucks are bumping does around. This is just for one place that we hunt. Uh, and you have that, but also you have opening weekend of gun season. Mm-hmm. And something I've noticed these last couple of years is that first like two or three weekends of gun season mm-hmm. are great because the leaves aren't off completely yet, usually in Alabama. Mm-hmm. Like we're right in the middle of losing all of our leaves. So you still have some leaf cover, mm-hmm. uh, and they haven't been – freaking shot at you know for a month yet that people have been bow hunting but you know we don't have a lot of bow pressure here in alabama in most mu- places a little muzzlery Le- i mean still like that minuscule amount of pressure yeah. so then you get out there on opening weekend and you can just wax em. wax them which yeah. is what happened to me opening weekend i shot that that big six that we talked about last week but then the the following weekend you had luck on a piece of public near us but it's still the same thing like i i'm a firm believer that, that first couple weeks of rifle season it's really good, and it's double good around here because you're kind of getting you're getting into the rut, like they're doing rut stuff, you know. Yeah. So, uh, what was your thought process on this hunt? Like, let's kind of break it down and get into it. So, this is the first, other than us scouting out there a little bit this summer, this is the first time I stepped foot on that place. Yeah. So, I, I going in with the mindset, uh, there was a couple areas I had in mind that I knew based off hunts last year, and this kind of goes back to. God, what podcast episode have we talked about? I know we've done this a few times, but talk about like hunting your does close yep. to the rut. Yep. Um, Mike Perry talks a lot about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wes Moe talks a lot about that. Past guests like that. But I knew an area. I was like, man, I've got to go someplace just based off what you're saying. Because you said you've seen like big bucks chase this time of the year. Yep. Um, I haven't. But I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Yeah. But I just I haven't witnessed it. But I'm like, oh, well, I'm like, well, it's the same principle that we all that we talked about last year, like mm-hmm. with our SOA hunt and our mountain hunt last year. Still, you're you're basically two weeks out from what most people would consider peak rut. Yeah, and if you just happen upon that first doe, it, it's a rut fest, and that's what's happened to me out there before. Is just having now it doesn't happen very often. Like you have to be lucky mm-hmm. and and like really know your area. Um, it, it's either you really you know your area really well or you're really lucky, but probably a little bit of both. Um, and I've just, I've had hunts out there like that where I've seen like eight, nine rack bucks in a single morning, like Thanksgiving morning, Black Mm -hmm. Friday morning, uh, after one doe came through and seen buck fights, you know, just, it can be really good that first weekend, but it's not like, don't expect to sit on the rut funnel 
and catch a, a buck cr- just cruising in some wide open, you know, rut funnel at like, you know, 1030 a.m. Yeah. Like that's about two weeks from now. But if you're hunting close to the cover and you're hunting close to the does and you happen upon one of those very early does, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to have a good hunt. Well, so with all that kind of, you know, what you're, what you're saying, that kind of played a factor. I'm like, well, I need to focus on an area that has a lot of does, that has a lot of thick cover that these does are already kind of hemmed up in. And this is an area that we hunted. I hunted a little bit last year. I think I only hunted. I think I've only hunted that spot once or twice before. Yeah. Um, but every time I go in, I see at least four or five does. Yeah. And you know, I, I think when the last times I first, the last time I sat it last year, I think I saw like seven or eight does. Um, so I'm like, there's a bunch of does in the area. They're still going to be there. Um, you got a ton of thick cover in and around you, and it's like you know, it all plays a factor that I'm like, and I've cut really big buck tracks there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also I, I've talked to other individuals, um, who've hunted like the general area and they're like, you know, I've seen, you know, big deer there as well, but I've cut the tracks. I've seen the does. I'm like, there's gotta be, you know, a good deer in this general area, but I kind of went with a different mindset. I'm like, I'm going in with the thought process. I'm calling. Yeah. Okay. Which plays a big factor for this hunt. Um, I wasn't just going to go sit there and just see what happened in the day. I'm like, you know, we were all talking back and forth, texting back and forth. I'm like, you know, this week and next week, really next two to three weeks is like, you could have really good luck calling, specifically using calling tactics and strategies from episode 290 with Richard Fott. Oh, yeah. And that is exactly what I did, and it worked out extremely well for me. I mean, like, like quick. <laughs> so, so just to reiterate, too, this is a spot that – Initially, you found last year. You hunted it. I think. I think you only hunted it once last year. Yeah. We hunted the same area. Like we were together that day. Yep. And uh, and man, I had an area that I wanted to hunt so bad. It was I think such a good area, and uh, and I wasn't able to access it this year Mm -hmm. for various reasons. So it's kind of wasn't able to go in there. So that was a big disappointment. So I'm like, it was also open day of duck season. So I'm like, whatever. I'm gonna go freaking jump shoot some wood ducks <laughs> and uh it, 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 i was i was crushed when i found out i couldn't get back to that piece it, it, if you if you haven't already pissed off you know guys in your club which by the way i had listeners reach out about the drama with the hunting club <laughs> and everything it's kind of funny and uh, i'm like if you didn't already piss them off you know you go out there at 10 o'clock in the morning those guys kind of sitting out there like you know which there's nobody in that club that sits out past 10 no. uh at least this time of year and they start hearing y'all hammering ducks they're like yep he's gotta go <laughs> just vote him off the island he's gone yeah no we went to the pinout board and made sure there wasn't anybody out there there was one guy on the property but he was like on the com- like far north end so mm-hmm. we went all the way to the south end okay cool and uh and, and re-put out some cameras and stuff yep. while we were at it but anyways so you found that spot last year haven't scouted it it what what, what last year made you made you feel like Oh, I'm just gonna come right back in here. Well, talk about the spot, the timing, everything that, like your mindset going back into that spot. Yeah, so you have a lot of thick cover around there, and, and like we've talked about in the podcast before, like anytime you can watch like a thick draw, you know, especially like an example, like going through like a clear cut, like you're always gonna have movement going up and down that thick draw, and that's how this spot kind of sets up. So there's a really thick draw right there that I've seen deer cross through. Uh, last year I cut big tracks right there. And, and, and what what's the cover before? Um, keep going pines and then also just like a bunch of like grasses and stuff like that like a bunch of like especially like in that thick draw it's a lot of like stuff that's like you know head to chest high it is just like brush is Mm -hmm. the best way to describe it um and you get pines kind of all over this place Uh, really thick pines um like the kind of pines that i've now i don't know if i want to say this on the podcast no, I just say it. Uh, there, uh, so we've always used to talk about like you know pines like you know three, four, five, six years old are really good. After that, it kind of age out. I kind of don't think that anymore. I think you can start getting some older pines mm-hmm. and that are still thick underneath, but they're big enough. They're big enough that a deer, like a buck, can like navigate through it, but it's still got a lot of thick cover in there. Oh yeah, and that's kind of how this spot sets up. So, yeah, and uh, for the video version, I'm going to cut in uh, vi- cuz we took a little bit of video of this mm-hmm. buck. So, I'll cut in pictures and video. And you can see behind of, of what this looks yeah, like. Yeah, what the, what it looks like. And no, I I did I, I thought that so when we say that, I think they age out for like for hunting them. Like you're not going to you're not going to get in a tree above this and see 100 <laughs> yards and be able to shoot as as we're about to get to. But it holds deer yeah. like to me it, it's almost at its as far as holding deer, I think it's actually at its prime. Yeah, and those are what probably ten years old. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Eight to ten years old. So like 
these pines are about as big around as your arm. Like you could get a saddle up in one or a, or a lock on, but you're not going to get higher than unless you you'd have to, if you're on some private property that you own, you'd have to limb a lot limb a lot of them in order to like get shot opportunities. But I mean, you could get a saddle or, or a stand up in them probably. Some of them probably eight feet up or so. I don't know. I don't know. There, there's a cup. There's a couple like that. Yeah, there, there's a few. But again, like, we'll cu- we'll cut in video so people can see exactly what it looked because we got video of where the deer was laying. Yeah. So. But uh, but anyway, so um, I, again, went in with mindset just calling. Like, hey, I, I'm going to actually. I was thinking about taking a gr- uh, rattle antlers, but I'm like, dude, I really don't want to rattle like in this spot just because like how it sets up. I'd rather do a lot of grunting and, and, and do uh, Richard Fox tending grunt sequence mm-hmm. and just see if I can happen to like have one like slipping like I could either hear one coming through the pines or slipping across like through the draw or like through some of this other cover. Um, and, and also, you know, if I lay eyes on one at a distance, it's like, you know, moving pretty quickly, you know, through some of this cover, I can maybe try to get his attention and stop him. Yeah. Um, so went in, got the whole, got everything set up, went in real early because I was worried. I'm like, man, you know, it's a spot. It's a spot that gets a lot of pressure. Um, you, you, you see a lot. You, you get a lot of pressure in this area. So I'm like, I'm gonna get there really early, and I'm gonna be sitting in the tree 45 minutes before daylight. And that's exactly what I did. I was sitting in the tree at 5:05, and legal lights not until like 5:50. Um, and I'm like, I'm just gonna get tucked up in here, ready to go, Black Friday, um, and to see if I can get all you know situated. Um, and then right at, I'm talking about right at gray light, right at 550, 555. I, you could see probably like a hundred yards. Like if a deer was moving, you could see it a hundred yards, but if it was standing there, it'd be kind of still hard to see, but it was legal light. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, um, you know, th- this looks pretty good. Um, and I was like, I'm going to wait a little bit and probably right around six o'clock, six Oh five. I did my first calling sequence. I did. Grunt tending uh, grunt sequence. I should have brought my grunt call in here to uh, do it for the listeners, but go back and listen to episode uh, 290 with Richard Fodd, and he yep. really explains it, and he actually demonstrates it on the podcast, so you can yep. hear him do it. It was a really good job. But uh, I did that first calling sequence, you know, eight, ten grunts, um, and then waited, you know, probably ten minutes. Nothing happened. I guess about 6.15 or so. I do it, I do it again and do the same calling sequence, and not – Five or ten minutes later, I start hearing, like, super slow walking, like, coming through those pines. Mm. Like, uh, r- r- right, right next to me. Gray just, light? No, no, no. It's it's after gray light. You know, sunrise, I think, was uh, 625 or something like that. Okay. And this is, like, 620. Okay, gotcha. And it's, I just hear this, like, this slow, methodical walking, and it would stop. I'm like, that's got to be a freaking deer. Uh, and it's coming, yeah. and like, and I, I'm in and amongst a lot of these pines, and it's, I mean, it's thick as crap right there. I can see out in front of me a good ways, but like right there where I'm at, it's really thick. And uh, and I'm like, dude, that deer, it, it's it's like, it's got to be, I'm like, man, it's probably a doe. But then I'm like, no, nah, it's probably a buck. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, why would a doe, because I've never seen a doe like work up through that one spot. I've always seen them like come out through a couple different areas. So I'm like, man, I'm gonna, st- I'm gonna hurry, get stood up, get my gun ready, get everything situated. So I, I, I'm up, I'm up on the, I'm standing up, and I got my gun and everything. And uh, all of a sudden, it, I just keep hearing it, keep hearing, it, and I'm like, dude, that thing's coming right at me. And I'm looking in these pines, and I'm like, I don't know if I can get a shot. Like, I, like I might catch movement, and all of a sudden, I catch movement of like legs. Like oh. coming, like I can like look down through the pines, and they're like, you know, I can see like legs moving, at- deer legs. 15 yards? Yeah, yeah I, yeah. I couldn't see anything until it was like 15 yards. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, man, you know, it's probably a little buck or like that. And then all of a sudden, like, it stops again, and then it keeps coming. And I'm like, man, it's about to come out. Like, so on my scope, I've got a uh, Vortex Razor. Uh, it's their uh, 3 by 15 And I had it on 3 power, but it's got a parallax on it that you set for uh, focus for different distances. And I had it set for, uh, it was like 100 yards or something like that. So I cut it down to like 30 yards because I'm like, this deer is coming right to me. So I, I turn it, I turn it almost all the way down, and uh, it comes out behind a pine tree, like some, like comes out through some of these pines, and I catch a main beam. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. It's, you know, it's, it's a buck, but all I can see was like just the front part of his main beam. And he takes one more step, and it's just tines, 
and I'm like at ten yards, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, buddy, you're done. Like, like, like that's a good deer. That's a really like oh, first thing going through my head. I'm like, that's the biggest deer I've ever shot on this place, or probably sh- shot in Alabama, or and uh, it steps out. It's ten yards, and I like throw the gun up. And the second I throw the gun up, I'm looking down on top of him, like right on top of his shoulder, and he like turns and looks up at me. I'm like, oh yeah, you're a good deer. Boom! And just like <laughs> it just happens. So, ten yards. Ten yards. Just so. What, quick. what was he looking at you? Did he? Did he, you move? Yeah. Well. Yeah, he caught me. I think it was. You were like way above that deer. Yeah, but I th- I think he caught like just like the sound of the stock like coming up to my shoulder, oh. like kind of like you know if if you like if you sh- especially it was, it was a cold morning. It was a cool morning. Uh, if you pick your gun up, and same thing, draw your bow. Like there's like a slight noise that like pretty much any clothing is gonna make. Yeah, and it was so quiet. It was like so calm and He's quiet. Like, oh, what's that sound? Yeah, and he just kind of like looked up at me, and I was like, "Oh, boom!" And this dude, <laughs> last thing he saw was that red beard. Yeah, son. right. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> put it right on top of his shoulder and just shot right down on top of him, and he just folded, dude. And when he folded, he fell over and kicked once, twice, and was done. And I'm like, "Are you freaking kidding me? It's six twenty-five, dude, Dang. in the morning." And uh, just after go, all this talk over the last couple of weeks about how we never see deer early in the morning like that or we never see bucks like right at shooting light it's always like an hour well actually i don't think we've released that episode no that yet. episode comes out next week oh, or yeah. comes out in a couple weeks oh hey there's a grunt call right there you could have used on the bookshelf right there oh okay hound's tooth it's covered with blood mm. so i got i don't know i don't even remember how i got it bloody give, give me some cwd from that grunt call. <laughs> yeah that's a joke guys um but anyway so um Anyway, he, he folds up, and I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I text everybody, and I'm like, dude, I think I just shot my, my biggest Alabama butt. Um, and uh, I I was like, I think he's a mainframe eight. Like, he's got real tall G2s. Like, he, he he's, you know, tall. He's not really wide, but he's just real tall. And uh, when he laid down, he lay – I mean, he was laying at 10 yards. And I'm, like, looking at him, and I could see, like, Part of his main beam, kind of like Thomas's deer. He's oh, talking about yeah. Arkansas. He's like, yeah. well, what's he looking like? You know, how's he look? He's like, you know, he was laying in a way. I didn't realize I could. he's got a really good side, and he's got, like, another side. Good. His his left side's a good side, but it's not nearly as impressive as his right. And I was looking at his G2. I'm like, man, he's got, you know, 8-inch G2s, you know, 4- or 5-inch G3s. Uh, and, you know, really nice brow, good brow time, too. So I'm like, awesome. And all this kind of played out. And what's funny was kind of jump ahead when you got there when i finally got out climbed down and got to him i'm like i couldn't even see his good side his good side was like buried up underneath the leaves and i'm like holy crap man like he there's there's awesome but another cool thing about that hunt so that happened i mean super early first year i saw was that buck that i shot yeah and um when i texted you and called you and everything we talked about everything you're like hey man you know i'm just doing kind of an observation sitting in the ladder stand on, on the club <laughs> yeah i put mike again in, in the good spot poor huh. mike man oh boy ain't seen a deer since gun season started oh yeah i told him he used up all his luck you know well you ain't put him back where he needs to go back where he's been bow hunting yeah he should he's been hunting well, different I, spots i don't know if that spot's gonna pan out i mean i don't know it might uh but yeah i, I put him in in a, a really good spot i think but now that He's hunted it, and Sam's hunted it, and I've hunted it. I think it's maybe more of a morning. Well, let me think. Yeah, I think it's more of a morning spot. Mm-hmm. But he, we, I put him there that morning. He didn't see anything, uh, and so I just went. To it's go a get morning him. spot, but you didn't see any deer. Yeah, in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't win every time. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I just went to the clear cut. We put up a ladder stand on the clear cut on the property, and uh, I was sitting in that, and I was in it for like about thirteen seconds. And I was like, I don't like this spot. <laughs> yeah, I just I got up there, and I'm like, because eh. we bow hunted, uh, kind of where this thing is looking down. There's like a hub. There's an SMZ that runs right through the middle of this mm-hmm. clear cut, and you can see through it. Uh, very similar to uh, uh, Corey Brown's episode from a couple weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, very similar to that. You can see through it. You can see the other side. Uh, but we bow hunted in that hub, mm-hmm. and there was really nothing down there that mm-hmm. excited. There was no tracks, droppings, rubs, nothing. Yeah. And uh, there, I mean, there's some tracks in the in the clear cut, but nothing crazy. And so I was up there for a minute, and I just got there because I'm like, I'm just gonna do an observation sit. Uh, I, I'll get into it later. But there's some on the good part of the property where we've been having all the buck encounters, where I killed my buck. There's been a change over there that I think has kind of disrupted everything. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, I'm just going to go do an observation sit over here. And yeah, I was in that stand. I don't like observation sits. Like, it's hard for me to bring myself to do it. Well, listen, so, an observation sit with a rifle is a hunt. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But I didn't think I was going to see a buck. And yeah. I'm not doe hunting mm-hmm. at, at all this year. Um, 
because I've already got too much, or I got enough deer meat, um, so I don't want to go shoot a doe right mm-hmm. now, especially since I'm planning on killing two more bucks, um, hopefully. But yeah, I I was on that, and by t- you called me, or I think I called you, texted in the our group message, mm-hmm. and uh, you were like, just shot a buck, and I just instantly called you. And I was like, hey, I'm coming to take pictures of you. <laughs> I'd rather come and help you drag yeah. this buck than sit here and not say anything. Yeah. And Well, the uh, so uh, another cool thing about this hunt, which kind of confirmed what I was thinking about, you know, does being there. I think I'd seen 10 or 11 deer by the time you got there, and you got there like at 8.15 yep. or something like that. Uh, had a bunch of does come out, uh, kind of, you know, working through the area. Had a young buck pop out, and he came and kind of served, you know, like one and a half year, a little four-point came and started harassing some of the does mm-hmm. um, and, and kind of moving some does around. And when the does were like not interested in them, he just kind of split off and they just kind of started feeding throughout that cover. Um, and it was kind of funny because when you pulled up, I was like, hey, there's still, like I've got deer all around me. Like there's like, I had some does walk right by me. Um, you know, that little buck's out there. I'm like, they're 80, 90 yards from me. And I, I couldn't see them when I was sitting down. But when I stood up, um, I could see him like just into some of that cover, like down into that little low spot. Uh, there was a bunch of big brush and, uh, they were just down there feeding and like the sunlight would hit them and like you catch like a flicker of an ear or something like that. Yep. And, uh, I think they were still there when you got there. I, I guess they just eased off. They never blew or anything, but I think they just eased mm-hmm. off when you got there. But I mean, just saw a bunch of deer that morning, which I mean, I'm like confirmed. I'm like, no, this is the area you need to spend some time. And there's a bunch of does, oh, yeah. young bucks in the area. Um, I didn't really, you know, I didn't find any, like, rubs or scrapes in the area, but, like, the does are there, so the buck should be here at mm-hmm. some point, just mm-hmm. case in point, shooting that buck. Um, but, of course, we got down, you know, took photos the whole nine yards of the deer uh, and uh, was able to cart them out on the old game cart, bro. That thing. Game changer. That, no, that, that, that game cart um, has seen a thing or two. Okay. That game card's a piece of junk, man. Like that thing is destroyed. It's held together by a ratchet strap that pops off half the time and yeah. it is a very aggravating game card. So but it's it's drug out a bunch of bucks for us at this point. Yeah. So now I'm I I was telling you, <laughs> we need to go and buy a nicer game cart and retire that one and hang it like back in the studio <laughs> somewhere <laughs> with all the blood and dirt and everything yeah. on it. Don't wash it. We're just throwing that sucker right up on the wall. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we'll, like, backlight it. Kind of like retiring a jersey or something. <laughs> <laughs> the end of an era. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. Because, like, you know, we pack out uh, quite a few deer every year. But, like, there's Depends some. Depends on where you're at. There's some there, there's some places and some areas that I'm like, dude, let's just cart them out um, and not deal with them in the woods. Especially, and we've talked about this a little bit. Like, if it's an area I'm going to come back to, if I don't have to, like, gut a deer right there or, like, mm-hmm. you know, pack a deer out right there i don't i don't want to like it's better not to so let's get them out whole we'll deal with them back of the truck or take them to a different location and gut them and everything um and just kind of keep that area as clean as possible which comes yeah. into a play for the following day <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so, so so you you killed that buck um everybody happy it was a big old buck. When I got to it, when you sit the pictures from the tree stand, I'm like trying to figure out how good this buck is. Yeah, you can't tell. Because from up there, I'm like I'm like zooming in. I'm like, eh, it looks like a decent deer, you know? Yeah. Like <laughs> nothing crazy. But then I got there and seeing him in person, I was like, oh yeah, that's a good deer. Yeah. And and like really, what's nice about him is is like you said, the time length. Mm-hmm. His G twos are like gr- freaking great. Yeah, that buck is a, exactly what I thought my second buck in Arkansas was. For real. I, I, thought, I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. That yeah. is what I yeah. thought I killed in yeah. Arkansas, and he was like 25% smaller. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's what I thought I was walking up on. So I was like, dang, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a nice deer for sure. And he's like, he's kind of high and tight, which is kind of typical. There's a lot of bucks around there that are like that. Yeah. He's, he's high and tight. I mean, he's got really good width, and he's got good mass. Uh, how wide do you think he is, like? 14 inches or something like that yeah maybe i mean he's right at the ears yeah i mean maybe but and, he's tall. but he's freaking tall yeah and so really characteristic of that area well it's um, like i've talked to guys that you know hunt a, a lot of like different parts of alabama where you have a lot of pine thickets and i, I had some guys tell me he was like yeah if you if you were 18 to 20 inches wide walk through a pine thicket that would be miserable but like that would be hard it, and it's like you know i don't i don't think habitat i don't know how much habitat plays a factor for like genetic traits of like more efficient for like living in those areas mm-hmm. um but you know that would make sense as an aspect of like you know if you're hunting 
incredibly mm-hmm. thick cover. That's interesting. That you know, it would make more sense to be like high, tight, compact frame with like heavy mass than really, really wide frames. Which I mean, you can still kill like really wide frame deer in those areas. Yeah. Like you know, a deer that's like eighteen plus inches wide to me is a wide, like a wide buck, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, you can still kill kill deer like that. But like the typical bucks you find in, the, in a lot of areas, especially in Alabama, in those like really pine, those thick pine country areas, is a lot more like hey, they're you know, 15, 16 inches wide, maybe at that, but they're just tall time, you know, they're compact yeah. frames. Um, and I just wonder if it's indicative to like that, um, quote unquote, ag culture, um, uh, tendency for those areas. I would, I would have never thought of that. That's interesting. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder, I mean, maybe it could be, I don't know. We it's need, like you we need that, to talk to a biologist. You get down those big river bombs, and you know they got some thick cover, but not nearly as much as like yeah, you know they can grow as wide as they ain't want got no to. pine thick. Yeah, yeah. That, hey, you know what's funny? Different it's, kind of thick cover. So our, our buddy Chris Leppert, I uh, sent him one of the or he he sent me you know we posted some of the photos of the deer, and uh, he sent me a photo. He said, man, congratulations. He's like, by the way, because well, he's gonna come down and hunt in Alabama with us. He's like, hey, well, we're gonna hunt in Alabama. Is it gonna be this thick? <laughs> <laughs> if and, you want it to be, yes. And I'm like. There's places you could find it that thick where we're going to go, but it's not going to look necessarily like that per se. Yeah, uh, where we're going to be hunting in Alabama. But uh, he's like, okay. He's like, I, I was just wondering. He's like, I, I was, I was curious while like you shot him at ten yards with a rifle, and I'm like, well, you know, whether he came at you know ten yards or hundred yards, you know, he was going to get shot. But uh, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, that's what we deal with a ton. Is like yeah. you know those crazy, crazy thick pine thickets, and it's like if you're not from the South, it's very hard to relate truly how thick a pine thick can really get, especially yeah. if it's not being managed by fire or anything like that. Um, it, it, it's, it's incredible. I mean, that, to really see that. That's like that, that doe I shot on opening day this year. Mm-hmm. When I was tracking her, I had to leave my bow at the edge of the pine thicket, take my backpack off, take my hoodie off and literally crawl, belly crawl underneath stuff yeah, to underneath go through that pine thicket. Yeah. It was like the thickest stuff I've ever been in in my entire life. And she was like, blowing through that no problem mm-hmm. she wasn't even breaking stuff yeah like the d- blood trail just like went through it i'm like how did how do you even get through this yeah but anyways super weird it's super weird so ne- next day so yeah so i was like man the next day i'm like i got one tag up but next day i, w- I want to go back in i want to go sit that same spot because i'm like you know maybe i find a bigger buck that comes through there because now i'm like if i shoot another buck i, I really want to try to kill one even bigger than that deer and i think it's possible um for mm-hmm. sure it's just you know, being very selective on what you're trying yeah, to shoot. I was telling, I told you, because, like, I, like that that was a big deer for sure, like, obvious shooter, but I'm like, I, if this same buck walks out tomorrow, I would not shoot it because you got one tag, and yeah. we, got, we got two or three hunts coming up where you have, in Alabama, the potential to legitimately kill, like, 140 class deer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I'm like, don't shoot anything unless it's, like, that 130 up, yeah, yeah. you know? Cause dude, and, and see what's funny is Andrew's the one telling me this. I know usually it's opposite. Yeah, Andrew's like, man, I'll just you know what you know whatever. <laughs> I'll freaking pull the trigger, baby. It don't matter. <laughs> but uh, well, it, part of it is because you know we had we're hunting the same SOA we hunted last year. Yeah. In a in a very similar part of that. So last year I drew the SOA. This year you drew it, which is nice because we stagger our points. Yeah. So uh, it works out. Um, and we're hunting the units directly adjacent mm-hmm. to the units we hunted last year. Which, you know, obviously we didn't go on because they weren't our units. But yeah. the guys we shared camp with hunted them. Mm-hmm. So we got all the tips from those guys. You know, we already talked to him. Yep. And I'm like, dude, the deer that we saw out there last year and the history we have with it now, like it's such a good opportunity to get to go back the following year mm-hmm. on a similar area. Like I'm prime time. so excited about the prime time. Yeah. I'm beyond excited about that. Hunt. Like we have, we got some potential there to yeah. There's some giants on that place. Yeah. And no, we're not going to name it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're not going to. People are like, why don't you name the SOA? Yeah, don't you know? message us about it either, guys. Yeah, we're not. We will get left on red. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the next day, I, I was like, I'm going to go back to the same spot and just see what happens. This is, you know, do call Andrew Maxwell observation sit with a rifle. <laughs> and uh, like, let's just, let's just see what pops out. Did the exact same thing. Got in real early, 45 minutes before daylight. Got set up. Same situation, right at gray light, did a grunt call sequence, did, did a tending grunt sequence. Again, episode 290, Richard Fott. Go yep. listen to it, guys. And um, nothing happened. You know, it was kind of a little slow. And I kept doing them like every 20 to 30 minutes, okay? By the third one I think I did, or maybe the fourth one I did, it was like 710 or something like that. Probably the third one I did. It was around 710 in the morning. And I start, and I hear like, 
how do I describe this? Um, I heard a similar sound cadence of what I'd heard with the buck before, but louder. Okay. Okay, as in like deer's coming in down the same freaking trail that the one I shot the day before was coming down. The same trail. Basically like 25 hours later. Yeah, coming down the same, anyway, the exact same trail. And this kind of goes back to like, you know, if you don't have to gut a deer in a spot that you think is going to be good and you can go back and hunt, like, don't do it there. Like, get the deer out of the area before you gut them. Um, it comes dude, it comes down the same trail. And I, and it's like breaking crap. Like, it's like breaking branches and sticks and stuff. I'm like, dude, this sounds like... Like, maybe it's a little deer making a little bit of noise. But, like, this sounds like a bigger buck, a little more dominant buck, like, making yep. his present known yep. while he's coming in. Where the other one, the day before, he was kind of slipping in, kind of like, you know, real curious-like. This one was not doing that at all. Like, you yeah. could hear. But, again, the problem is in this pine, with the pine thicket, you can't hear them until they're, like, 20 yards from me, 25 yards from me. Um, even though it's real thick like that. It's like they move through real quietly, and then for whatever reason, because, like, the, the amount of uh, foliage in the area, it, I think it, like, dampens a lot of the sound. Yeah. So I didn't hear him until he was, like, maybe 25 yards, and I'm like, oh, crap, that's got to be another buck. And it's, I mean, it was, like, way louder than the one from before. Yeah. And... uh and I got I got caught and I, I was taking my climber on this hunt specifically, uh, just so I can climb up and kind of like see down into all this like see down to like this area and like see down to the draw and like kind of see out through all the cover. Yeah, and just just to also reiterate, mm-hmm. um, because the way we're talking about it, it kind of sounds like you're just hunting a pine thicket. You're hunting the edge of this pine thicket. Yeah, where you can see down into a thick draw mm-hmm. that connects that pine thicket to a different one. Yeah, you know, without giving too many details. But so so you got a lane where you can shoot three hundred yards. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, but these deer just so happen to be like right on top of you in the pine thicket yeah. that you're sitting on the edge yeah, of. Yeah. So you're not just like going and climbing a tree in the middle of the thickest stuff ever where no. you can't see but like 10 yards. No, but like, yeah, it, it, but it seems like that though with all the deer that pop out. So, um, I get caught. I'm like, I need to stand up, but I'm like, <sighs> I don't stand up. And I'm like, cause like it, it was, it was the thing about when my, the deer the day before I shot, when he came in, it was still like the sun was starting to rise, so everything was still shady. So you can see underneath like some of those trees. Yeah. Now the sun's up, and mm-hmm. it casts such a harsh shadow in those pines. It's like you can't see. It's really hard to see. It's, it's like it. looking into a black hole. Yeah. So I'm like, crap, I don't know where he's at. Because the one the day before, like I heard him, but like I still see pretty good. I'm like, I don't see him, so I'm going to stand up real quick and get situated. This time when I heard him, I'm like, I don't know if he can see me, oh, and yeah. I don't know if I, I can't see him. So I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm just going to hold tight. It, I should have stood up, okay? Yeah. And, uh, and this kind of goes to the story. So he comes in just breaking crap, dude. It comes in breaking crap. And all of a sudden, I see legs, and I'm like, crap. Like, okay, he's 15 yards, and it stops. And I'm like, it, it like moves around. I'm like, I don't know if I could see part of its face. I could see part of the deer moving, like mm-hmm. kind of moving a little bit, like looking side to side. Yeah. And I don't know, I couldn't see white, but I don't know if I was seeing like part of the, the nose. I don't know what I was seeing, but I could see the legs and I could see something moving kind of back and forth a little bit. And, uh, and I'm like sitting there, I'm like, crap, if I was stood up, like I might be able to like get a better idea of what this deer is. And it's right on that same trail. And then like, it just stops. Mm. And I'm like, crap well now it's like right here i can't stand up yeah like if i stand up like it's more than likely you'll be able to look up at me and probably maybe see me through some of the limbs of the pine tree yeah so i just sat there and i was like crap like and dude my heart is i'm talking about racing boy <laughs> i'm talking it was coming it, it was an andrew maxwell soa hunt all over again like heart coming out like because i'm just thinking like this is that 140 inch deer mm-hmm. like you know and uh Dude, I was I was sick. I'm like I'm like I should have stood up. Should have stood up. Should have stood. Up. And I'm like, man, maybe I need to try to stand up. And I like I try to like ease myself off that that climber seat. And like I get like barely an inch off the seat. And I look down in front of me, and not sixty yards from me, I got two does working towards me. And I'm like, crap. And I'm like, and they're walking right towards me. And I'm like, well, this isn't gonna work now. You know, I got them coming in, plus his buck standing right here next to me. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ease back down. <laughs> so, like, squatted <laughs> back down and sat there. And I'm, like, watching them. And, like, I can't hear this. This deer standing still. It's yeah. right next to me. And I'm, like, I, like, look back at it. I'm, like, I can't. I can't see, like, again, the shadows and stuff. I can't see it. The only time I could see it was, when, like, when it was moving. You couldn't take your binos out? I, so, there's another thing. 
So you probably had them ten buys or twelve. Twelve buys. buys. Yeah, that's why you don't carry those. So the day before, I carried my eight my eight by forty twos, which you know a great all round bino. Okay. This time I'm like, man, I'm gonna take my twelve powers, uh, just in case, you know, you know, if I want to kind of get an idea of something at a little bit more of a distance. And dude, I, man, I had the when those binos are my, so I always put my in my bino harness. I put my phone in there with my binos, okay? Mm-hmm. So my my phone is in the same pocket with the binos, so I can like quickly get my phone in and out, but also I can get my binos in and out real easy. Yep. Well, the ten with the eight by forty twos, it's fine. With the twelve bys, it's a little tight. Uh, so like I'm like I'm trying to like undo like open the top of the bino harness and like try to pull my binos out and they're stuck and I'm like I can't make any noise dude because because mm. I already know the noise it makes like when they're in there like that like it's kind of like a, a like a dragging sound oh uh, yeah and I'm like oh dude I can't do this. so like I'm like dude I'm for like, for like ten minutes like the deer's just like standing there and I'm like for ten minutes I'm trying to get my freaking binos out oh my god and then, and finally I'm like I'm just gonna get them out so like I push my hold my phone down with one hand pull the binos up, pop them up, and then I get them, like, with one arm. I'm like, dude, I'm trying not to move, and I'm, like, with one arm, like, trying to, like, pull my binos up, and I'm looking, and I'm, like, trying to roll focus and everything, and I'm, like, looking at, like, 15 yards through cover. With 12 bys. With 12 bys. And it was, like, the the thing is, I could see fur, okay? Mm-hmm. But I'm see- you're seeing, like... So he's still standing there. Yeah, but you're seeing, like, the single hair follicle. Okay, like you're like looking, like you're. Like, I can't tell what I'm looking at. Like it's it's hair. Why didn't you throw your rifle up? Too much movement because I, I had my rifle. I had my rifle across my lap, and I'm like, I don't know if I can get the gun up in like position to like look down at it, and uh, that comes up later as well. So this goes on for like 20 minutes. Wow. Okay, where the deer does not move okay. at all, and the does come up and everything. And I'm thinking he's probably yeah, even if you can't see antlers, that makes me think it's a buck. That's a very yeah bucky thing to do. Absolutely, like because all the does I saw, like every doe I've seen, like in that area, they're all like pretty like nonchalant. Like they're not all they're care. not alert. They don't, they're yeah. like it ain't no days. Yeah, and this buck was acting like the buck beforehand, but like on steroids. Like he's okay. crazy cautious, and which made me think like he's definitely not a young deer doing that. He's like, man, look at all that blood right there. I wonder what that's from. Well, <laughs> it, yeah, because it was five <laughs> yards from. Anyways, and where I, where I. Long story short, I pulled the gun up, and by this point, like he shifted a little bit, and I could not see him. Yeah, and I'm like, crap, where's he at? And finally, this is after like 30 minutes. I'm like, and it get the wind started kicking up a little bit, and I'm like, I can't hear anything. Yeah, so like, I'm just gonna slowly stand up and see if I can look down to that spot. Slowly stand up. I look with the binos, look with the gun, and he's not there. Mm. So like, at some point, he eased he off. Out. And I texted, I texted you and Michael Pike, and I was like, dude, I just because I couldn't even text you guys when this was all happening. I'm like, I can't do anything. Yeah. And um, anyways, and Mike's like, he might have laid down right there. I'm like, I don't, he could have, but like, I don't think he did. And uh, long story short, dude, you know, the rest of the hunt played out. I saw a few more deer that morning, uh, a few more does. And I finally, you know, I climbed down and everything. And when I climbed down, I'm like, I'm going to go look at, like, I'm going to look like into that spot where he stood at and just have an idea of like what he could see. When I climbed down and walked down a little bit, five yards and i looked up that trail he stood like right at this little high spot and he could see out through the pines mm. very easily at that point yeah so if there was a buck there or anything like that he could see easily down out in front of him um and i'm like that's why he just didn't decide to come in any further like he yeah. just that plus i smelled some blood and you know the tarsus from that other buck and he just kind of like held his ground but uh i'm like are you freaking kidding me? but anyways long story short the calling worked again yeah worked Spot on. I mean, exactly how you'd hope it would. It was just it, that area. It was so thick, and that buck just didn't take that few more steps out where I could get like a better idea of what he was. Which, uh, uh, which grunt call were you using? The messenger, uh, hooks messenger. Oh yeah, that's a freaking awesome grunt call. Yeah, actually, we just had a listener success story come in using the same grunt call, um, and he killed his biggest buck. I think that was in Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Uh, really big deer, like a two. I think he said it was like two hundred forty seven pounds on the scale. Um, but he did the same thing, used that yeah, same grunt call, and actually called that buck back to him. Like he just kind of skirted him. He called wow. it back and shot with a rifle at 15 yards. Man, so. that's that's crazy. Yeah, like that sucks with the bino thing. That's that's my so my philosophy on the binos mm-hmm. is like, I know I'm giving you unsolicited advice, but uh, I like to carry those eight buys even in situations like that one mm-hmm. for that exact reason. Because like my thought is like if I've got a deer out there at like. 300 yards especially like just knowing where you were hunting mm-hmm. is like 
if he's walking across that 300 yard, you know, opening, then I don't have a lot of time anyways. So I like, I've got to look at him, confirm I want to shoot him and get on him Mm -hmm. within, unless he stops within like eight to 10 seconds. Yeah. So I'm like, if he's out that far anyways, I got a 16 by scope on, you know, three by three by 15 (laughs) on my gun. So I'm like, I'll just crank that thing up and check him in the scope. And then if I decide he's a shooter, I'm already on the gun, ready to go. Yeah. You know, so like some situations I'd, I'd maybe bring the 12 buys, but I like those 12 buys for checking feed trees in early season. So, well, the reason why I want to take the 12s is there's, there's some other really thick cover out there that I really wanted to look into. And with the scope, like I didn't want to have to pull the scope up and like look like down into that stuff, mm-hmm. uh, stuff that was a lot further from me. Um, so that's why I brought the 12s because I'm like, you know, I'm, it's Farther than I'm going to shoot, but I want to, if there's, if there's a deer kind of like in this really thick stuff, um, you know, it's out there a good ways. I want to be able to like just scan over there and to see if it's, if it's working that area just uh-huh. to maybe make a move in. Uh, cause I'd seen deer work that same spot uh, the year previously. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, yeah, it came back to kind of bite me in the butt, but again, long story short, I should have just, the second you hear something like that, I don't matter what you think it is, stand, like if you're in the saddle, get your gun. Okay, get your yeah, bow. Get ready. If you're in a stand, stand up and have whatever weapon you have on hand and just get ready. Even if it's a you, – you might think – it might just be a doe. You're like, yeah. oh, it's probably a doe. Get up and be ready the second you hear something mm-hmm. um, because that – that I was too – I, I was too um, undecisive in the moment to do that. And if I would have just stood up, I might have had a better opportunity to kind of like look down through some of that stuff. Because when I stand up, there's a hole right there that originally I'd seen the buck in the pre- day previous. Mm-hmm. And when you sit down, you can't see into that hole. And I'm like, man, if I would have stood up, I might could have had an opportunity at him. That, that's a tough one because also, at, but what you did, I would say is actually pretty good advice. Uh, where if, if, you're, if you don't know whether or not the animal can see you, then you probably shouldn't move. Yeah. Like that, that's pretty good advice. You know, it, it kind of burned you this time. But as a general rule of thumb, that's a, that's a pretty good way of uh, of going about stuff, especially like with turkey hunting and stuff like that. Because turkey hunts mm-hmm. where I pick that up because I mm-hmm. do the same thing. If I if I can't see the animal or I can't confirm that I'm hearing it and it's over the lip of the hill or mm-hmm. it just can't see me, then I'm not moving. Yeah, you know, and I'm gonna sit there and I'm just gonna like move my eyes, not my head. And I'm just gonna keep my ears open until I can determine whether whether or not it can actually see me. Yeah. So like, yeah, you do get burned with that, but overall, I mean, I still think that's a good practice. I mean, it is, but the thing is, is like, if you think you can hear, it, it depends on like how far can a deer visually see in the spot when you hear them mm-hmm. or hear a deer. Like in that spot, like he would, it would need to be within fifteen, maybe twenty yards of you know, in order to maybe see me in that spot. Yeah. But. I think I heard him at 25, almost 30 yards, because he was making a lot more yeah. noise coming in. But you would have made noise standing up, and that's the problem. No, 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 no. I, it was, I wasn't worried about the noise standing up. I was worried about the movement standing oh, up. Oh, I got you. But like, it was yeah, almost, you were really well hidden up there. Yeah, but it's like, if, if I could have just... It goes back to, like like you said, if, if you don't know exactly where they're at, it's better just to hold tight. But if you have a pretty good idea of where you're hearing the sound coming from, and mm-hmm. you think there's a visual obstruction between you and the animal, the, yeah. the deer... Get up as quick as possible. Get ready just in case, because I mean, you never know in that situation. Yeah, but. yeah. I mean, yeah, you're definitely right. Um, sometimes you got to just make that judgment call, dude. I got, I have a turkey that haunts my dreams to this day. That have, me and Clay Collie were hunting one time, and uh, this turkey was like coming in, and I could hear him walking, and we were on this ridge point, and he was up above us, and so I, I had turned to the right, like kind of facing uphill. And I could hear him walking clear as day. Like, he wasn't gobbling or anything. Like, he had quit gobbling. He was coming. I could hear him walking. And I'm like, because you're looking up the hill, and their head is so small, like, they can just periscope and, like, Mm -hmm. look down that hill. And so I wasn't sure if he could see me or not, so I held tight. I did exactly what you did. And I'll be danged if that sucker didn't keep coming and coming and coming and coming. And he popped out at, like, seven yards and just completely busted me. I was, like, like 15 degrees off, and I couldn't get him. So, like, yeah, I mean, it that, that's burned me, too, in the past. Like, sometimes you just got to make a judgment call. If you can hear them and not see them, mm-hmm. you, like, have faith that they don't hear you because that's the difference between you getting it and not getting it. Yeah. Because I'm thinking maybe if you could have cranked your scope back to three and you're already standing up, you could kind of do oh, this number right here. For sure, absolutely. Yeah, and no see doubt. what he actually was. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I mean, I mean that's kind of like what I did. Well, I didn't even have to do it with the deer the day before because he just kept coming. So I'm like, hey, he's about to come through, like, this little hole right here. 
I'm going to stand up and like literally be ready in that hole. And when he popped out, I'm like, oh yeah, he's a shooter. And you know, it was able to settle on him and, and get him shot. Um, but you know, something else, this is, this is the first time ever. Like I've killed some deer calling before, but now I've killed two bucks in Alabama. Both of them were by calling. One was by rattling. The yep. one in October yep. rattled, rattled him in to like 25 yards, got him shot and then killed this one grunting. And one thing I was, I was, I said this on the Arkansas hunt uh, podcast, I think a little bit, but I kept telling myself and telling you guys too, like on that hunt is like, I'm going to call as much as I can because, and one thing I realized, especially grunting, like what Richard Falk talks about, mm-hmm. I've done it with does around and I did it actually a couple days, like actually I did it a couple days ago and had does come in like 10 minutes after I called. And I'm like, I think if you grunt the way that Richard talks about grunting on that episode, again, episode 290, you're not scaring any deer. No, like you're, definitely. Especially if it's not like a very just crazy, crazy deep grunt. Because that Missionary Grunt Call, I think they designed it for like to sound like a two and a half year old buck. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's very, it's not overly intimidating. It's more like a curiosity. I feel like a curiosity sounding call where like bucks are like, oh, I kick his butt. Yeah. They walk in there and the does is like, oh, I don't care. It's a little, you know, young buck. Mm-hmm. But, um, but it's making your own luck. I feel like calling is like making your own luck. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, if you sit there and wait, you're just waiting to hope something happens. We're like calling, you're absolutely, you're trying to make something happen yeah. instead of waiting for something to happen. It's like yeah. making your own luck by calling. Yeah, that, that call is definitely a good, happy medium. Like, I really like a call like that that's kind of a, on the higher end, mm-hmm. um, not like a crazy deep grunt. Because even last year, dude, that that big buck I missed on the SOA, he came in and he was grunting, and his grunt was not that deep. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a big buck, and his grunt was not like this, like crazy. Yeah, it sounded pretty similar to that hooks. You know, it's a little bit deeper than that, but not much. Yeah. So I I personally like a call like that. I don't like a really deep, just nasty call. I mean, maybe if you're in Iowa and you're hunting a freaking three hundred pound deer. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think the body size plays a huge factor because I just I just feel like a a bigger body deer is going to have a, a lot more deeper grunt. But then again, are you in an area where there's a lot of those kind of deer mm-hmm. or is there only a couple of, and maybe depending on the buck doe ratio, maybe they're not over like all like just big fighting yeah. deer. Like they just don't, you know, maybe they're not as confrontational and every buck's a little bit different. Like you've had guests on the podcast talk about, uh, you know, every buck has their own personality and some bucks maybe are more fighters than others, but like having like, you know, one of those calls or like that hounds to the grunt call sounds a lot of the same as well. Yeah. Where it's like, it's not so deep that it's like overly intimidating, but it, it still allows for like that curiosity of like, Hey, I'm going to go check that out. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. But yeah. So, you know, killed two bucks so far in Alabama calling this year, which is pretty awesome. So maybe we'll make it three calling. Yeah. Who knows? Awesome. Especially that SOA hunt's going to be a calling hunt. Yeah. Like that's going to be a good time to call. But anyways, all right, so we'll talk about. Uh, I think we'll talk about my hunting club stuff probably next week. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to get some to some Q and A's here. Uh, Jacob, where can people find the uh, Q and A section? Yep. So uh, you guys can leave us uh, Q and A's again, questions that we'll answer on the podcast uh, down in the show notes on the podcast, and then also the show description on YouTube. Uh, there's a link down there you can get those submitted along with your listener success stories. Again, we've had a ton, and I mean a ton of listener success stories coming over the last month, which has been awesome to kind of see. Um, again, like I just mentioned, we just had one come in from a, a guy killed a real big deer in Mississippi using uh, episode 290, uh, calling the right way with Richard Fott, the episode I've been referencing in this episode, um, using the exact same calling style and having great success with it. So again, make sure you li- submit your listener success stories there too. But again, on every outro breakdown episode, we always try to answer a couple of these uh, Q&As and we've had some really good ones coming. So what's our first one we got, Andrew? All right, this is a more recent one. This is from Cody Collins. He said, Andrew, on episode 533, you mentioned you are hunting less, but seeing more deer. Can you provide more insight on the changes you've made any clarification or insight needed uh from pl- me please let me know thank you uh, so what he's referring to is i think the other day we were talking about uh how this year i haven't i haven't hunted as much as i have in past years but i'm seeing a lot more deer and i'm like my ratio is a lot higher mm-hmm. um and i i think i think it's came from the whole mentality of uh like scout twice hunt once mm-hmm. because I, I have given up a lot of hunting days and y'all were giving me crap about it early in the season, especially uh, because y'all were y'all were all up hunting this one place, mm-hmm. and I was I was like, oh, I'm just gonna scout today. I'm just gonna scout. And earlier in the season, I mean, I literally took probably four or five days where I could have hunted, and literally just scouted the entire time. Like I might have had my bow with me, but I was just walking the whole time. Uh, there's that, and then also on a day that I actually am going to hunt, if I don't have like a predetermined spot 
then I'm basically doing the same thing. I'm going to I'm just going to walk with my bow until I find something worth setting up on. Mm-hmm. Which there's a lot of episodes we've had in the past about like determining what that looks like. Uh, episode 510 with Rick Cope is a pretty good one if you're talking about hunting feed sign specifically. Um, and then Jacob Leishen, that's another really good one. That's a really good one. Uh, 530, uh, episode 530. That's a that's a good one to listen to because that's basically what I've been applying is like is like uh, not just hunting a spot just to hunt a spot. You know, not not hanging in a tree just to hang in a tree, but going to spots that either I know are good from my previous scouting or walking until I find a spot, like in-season scouting, in-hunt scouting, Mm -hmm. until I find something better. And so I'm actually really liking the way this year's going. I mean, my luck could change at any moment, and I could, like, not see another deer the rest of the season. But so far it's worked really, really good for me. I mean, even in Georgia it worked really good for me where I was – I only hunted, like, two sits in Georgia, but both of those sits I had opportunities at deer. Yeah. So – you know, I, I'm fine with that. So it also goes back to that episode. I just, uh, I just had reshared this on our Instagram story. Uh, it's episode 404, uh, Scout More Than You Hunt with Colton Ship from Oklahoma. Yes. Uh, he kills a ton of big deer out there on public land, and he likes to kill them post-rut. He likes to hunt a lot during post-rut because during the rut out there, um, at least in the area that the, the state he hunts in on public, um, there is a very intense gun season during the rut. So he likes to leave that for all the gun hunters. He's a big bow hunter and he'll go back after the rut happens. And after the gun hunt takes place, relocate all these bucks and then go kill them later in the rut. And he talks a lot about that. Like he's like, dude, I may only sit nine or 10 times during the season, but I'll kill my two bucks in those, you know, nine or 10 sits. Uh, but he's like, I'm out there all the time scouting, running trail cameras, you know, inspecting new areas, trying to relocate his bucks uh, that he might have found maybe in September, or early October. Um, and, you know, goes and capitalizes them kind of late in the season. So, you know, he's another great example of, uh, you know, how to kill deer on less sits, but you're still spending a lot of time out there. It's not like you're just going in blind um, yeah. to go to a spot and, and kill a deer. Mm-hmm. Um, he still puts a lot of work and he's just not necessarily doing it by, you know, being in the stand or being in the saddle um, for, you know, that to happen. Yeah, exactly. And also, it, like, in, in my case, it also doesn't even mean that I'm going out all day Saturday and, hunt and, and scouting daylight to dark. It, it could be that I go out there for, like, an hour and I literally go spot check something, yeah. you know, on, like, a weekday, you know, because my, my club is really close to the house. Or, uh, or like, in Georgia, there was there – was, I had basically two days to hunt – I spent the the first afternoon. I literally just walked. I had my saddle, everything with me, and I just walked. And I never set up the entire day. I walked until dark, which was like mentally hard to do because I was like kind of mad the whole time because I'm like, oh, I can't find something we're setting up on. And then I felt like I walked past stuff I should have set up on, but like that's just the kind of stuff that you're gonna end up having to do, I think. And you get to see how this kind of plays out in real time as we continue to talk about this. But a little like I guess alluding to what's going on in my hunting club right now is basically. The, that 10 point was being super patternable for a long time. Mm-hmm. And when Mike missed him, this is right before gun season came in, he came out with his bachelor group. He was cool as a cucumber mm-hmm. way before dark. Mike missed him with a bow. And then uh, I, I don't have any cameras out, but again, Cody, who's a adjoining landowner, um, who me and him are, have been helping each other. We duck hunted together the other day. Uh, really liked that guy. He, uh, he, had been getting pictures of that deer very consistently. And he's like, hey, uh, that deer kind of split off from the group after that happened. He said that the deer started walking with a limp. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what happened to him because Mike definitely didn't hit it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we look, we examined the arrow and because Cody texted me, he's like, hey, did, did he hit that deer? Because he started walking with a limp. And I was like, no, we looked at the arrow. There was no hair, no blood, no nothing. And, he might uh, get hit by a car. He might have got hit by a car because he freaking crosses the road all the time, which mm-hmm. makes me nervous. Uh, or I mean, stepped in a hole. It's extremely rocky in there, mm-hmm. so I could have seen him, you know, stepping in a hole, you know, doing something to his leg, whatever. And he said that that buck started showing up. He was showing up right there with that bachelor group that I killed the six point out of. Mm-hmm. But ever since Mike missed him, he was showing up. I think he said an hour to an hour and a half later. So who knows. Uh, if I'd have let that six walk, maybe he would have come out in the been, last five minutes. No, it'd been dark, man. It well, been... I, but you're so close. You're like right on top of his bedding, so I I might have seen him. I don't think so. But like I said, like I I gave him plenty of time. I don't think he was coming out. But I think he was with that group. I think that he was still back in the bedding area though. So I was on top of him. I think. Um, 
And then I killed his buddy, and now he's probably like freaked out. <laughs> but anyways, so what that deer is doing, and he's is he's leaving the club. Mm-hmm. There's a adjoining property owner that land that's been vacant for like a long time. Cody said. And then north of that is Cody's property, where mm-hmm. he's got uh, standing beans up there. Mm-hmm. He's been getting pictures of that deer in the standing bean field a lot. And But someone bought that property that adjoins us and has been out there like a skid steer, and they've been cutting stuff, and I think they're cutting in roads or something. They're doing a lot of work out there. And since that happened, they haven't got a picture of him yet. So either he's dead, which I don't think he is, because Cody's really well-connected in this area. He knows a lot of people. Haven't heard about it getting shot. Haven't seen it dead on the road. No one of my clubs killed it. Uh, so we think that maybe that has disrupted his pattern. Mm-hmm. And so now we're in relocate mode. We're So now we're putting cameras out in kind of new spots. Like, where could he have bounced to? All that being said, this has come after after I killed that the big six. I think we've made three or four hunts in that same area. Mm-hmm. And the first one, I saw six does, which is pretty good. But everyone after that, we haven't seen anything. So probably going on three hunts now, we haven't seen a deer. So something has changed. They are on you, boy. So now we're falling back, and we're going back into scouting mode. So like this week, you know, one afternoon this week, I'm going to go out there for probably 30 minutes to an hour and literally just run and spot check stuff, try to find places to put cameras on road crossings, like low impact, low effort stuff for me because I don't have a ton of time to be out there. So I'm just going to go do what I can and, you know, not get so tied up. Like if it gets to be Saturday – Rather than uh, go hunt in the morning, go get lunch, and then go hunt in the evening, just go out there and maybe sit somewhere in the morning, but get up and start walking midday into the afternoon and and try to figure out what's going on rather than hunt. And so then I, you know, hopefully keep my ratio up. I just just thought of a business model. (laughs) Oh, my God. The guys that can't can't scat a whole bunch. You hire a dude that's got a lot of free time, but hey, dude, listen, you, you go find me my spots, <laughs> drop me some pins, I go, go in there. Go hunt. drop cameras in these spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go go spot check all this for me. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, all that to say that right now I'm kind of reverting back to the scouting thing. So, like, I'd, I'd scouted a whole bunch early season whenever I got a chance, and then for two or three weeks there, we were going right to the kill spots, and it was like, missed the Big Ten, Saw some does, killed the big six, saw six. Like, it was really good for, like, five hunts, and now it's dried back up. So rather than continue to hunt those spots over and over and over again, hoping it changes, we're going to we're gonna fall back, and we're going to relocate. We're going to figure out what's going on. Go find their most recent sign. Go get some more cameras out. Go look for tracks and try to figure out how these deer are avoiding us because they're somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And I will say that five of those six does were walking through the thickest crap ever. And they were like thirty yards from me, and I don't know if I could have shot them. Mm-hmm. Like they were, it was that thick. So, like they're they're in that stuff. Now we just gotta, you know, again adjust with them. So, anyways, all right. Next question. This is from Tyler Jones. He said Jonathan Moreland mentioned several times in y'all's most recent episode about quote unquote the right lunar phase. He also mentioned not hunting evenings or mornings due to certain lunar phases. Can you go more in depth with what that means? He also mentioned not hunting evenings or mornings due to certain lunar phases. Uh, so you actually reached out to Jonathan about this, right? Yeah. Yep. So uh, I actually sent that question to Jonathan um, just so we could get some clarification. And uh, I'll kind of read off his response. Uh, so this is Jonathan's response. Okay, so I definitely don't plan a hunt by the lunar phase. I always want to be in the woods whenever I can, po- or where whenever I possibly can, but I do get a boost of confidence when the moon is overhead or underfoot at prime time hours. And he puts in quotations, the hour, hour or so before dark and after daylight. Also, most of my mature, mature buck kills have been correlated within those times of the moon being overhead and underfoot. So, yeah. So what he's saying is he he doesn't skip hunts because of the wrong lunar phase. And he's not even paying attention to lunar phase. It's lunar position. Lunar position. Moon so position. overhead, underfoot. And uh, I will add that Michael Pike, we were talking to him the other day. And he's like, Maxwell, what time did you shoot that? You shoot your buck. I was like, about 4.50. He's like, uh-huh. <laughs> overhead was at 4.38. I'm yeah. like, whatever, dude. <laughs> I get it. Whatever. At the, and then you said something like, we were just in Arkansas for a a week straight Mm -hmm. and like did did you pay attention to the moon when we were in arkansas i tried to but um didn't pan out no 
<laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> this is why I can't get on board. Well, well like, I don't know. I need to look back at when I saw that big buck come through, but like, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I there's so many guys that we've had on the podcast that are so successful. Like yeah. Jer- Jeremy Aaron's one, Jonathan Moreland, uh, Scott Seals. Um, I mean, Michael Pike's one. You know, yep. we've had a lot of guys on uh, uh, Rick Cope that yep. talk about it, and I I think outside of the I mean maybe even during the rut but like especially outside the rut maybe it plays a factor for them but like my thing is if I have a cold crisp morning I don't care what the hell else is going yeah, on like dude I, I'm confident I'm confident especially like pre rut rut cold crisp morning that's all I'm looking for if it's 75 degrees and it's during the rut I'm you you've never seen, I don't care if the moon lines up or not I'm you, you see a more you've never seen a more miserable <laughs> uh you know mindset hunter than than me in that kind of case so yeah um but you know the thing is, though, you know, if, if that <sighs> what what Jonathan is I, saying, I, and Michael yeah. says this too. Michael's the same way. Mm-hmm. Which, if there is something to the moon, I think this is it. Uh, I don't know whether or not there's anything to it, but if it does have an impact, this is I. That's my what gut tells say. me this is definitely right. That is, deer are crepuscular, meaning they move around dawn and dusk. So no matter what is going on, it doesn't matter if it's eighty degrees. Doesn't matter the moon phase. Doesn't matter what the wind's doing. Mm-hmm. They're going to move more at dawn and at dusk. So if you think that the overhead and underfoot has some, you know, slight uh, impact on making them want to get up and go feed, then if you if that overhead moon it falls within that dawn or dusk time mm-hmm. frame or underfoot, then that's going to be your better time to hunt. Well, right? an example, like when you shot the six point, you were so close to the bedding that might who knows it might have enhanced movement of them getting up a little bit earlier in order to come out and start feeding. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I ain't asked the deer and, you know, get a personal <laughs> response from them yet. Um, but uh, it's it's something interesting to say the least. I mean, um, yeah. you know, I, I'll say this as well. So Pike told me when we were in Arkansas, because, you know, we had really good movement the first maybe four days we were there, four, really – really four days because even that yeah. fifth day like you, you killed your second buck but like it wasn't like great movement that day um uh, i killed him early too yeah but what, what i'm saying is pike was telling me he's like yeah dude as this week goes on he was telling me this before we can get there he's like, as this week goes on like it's probably going to slow down movement wise based mm-hmm. off the moon positioning and all that kind of stuff yeah and i'm like maybe that's the case or also i'm like i think there's the deer locked down the bucks are locked I, down I think i think well yeah here's the thing because this is my only problem with the moon thing. It's like, if you go look for a pattern, you're probably going to find it. You know, if you have a predetermined pattern in your head that you're looking for. And so you could say the moon phase slowed it down. You could say that the lockdown phase of the rut slowed it down. You could say that the amount of hunting pressure yep. slowed it down. Or you could say that the warming trend that we were on all that week slowed it down. Maybe it was all those things put together. Yeah. You know, like, you just don't know. But, like, what I'm saying is, like, you could go into that week and say, okay, the moon looks pretty bad for this whole week. It's probably going to get worse. And then you go there, and it gets worse. Well, it could have been any one of those things. Mm -hmm. You you can't isolate anything, which is why I think it's really hard to determine whether or not it's actually the moon. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyways, like, people have confidence in it. So, I mean, if you got confidence in it. I mean, I'm not going to lie. With the amount of people that we talk to, like Scott and Rick and Mm – Richard Fott and uh, Drew Jonathan, Drew Atkinson, all these people who believe in it. Like, if if I happen to look and it's an overhead moon fa- or an underfoot moon phase at like four thirty in the afternoon, I'm like, okay, cool. And it's mm-hmm. cold. I'm like, all right, uh, maybe I get a little more confident. But I'm not planning hunts around that. Yeah, uh, these guys do that. They they will plan a hunt like if it's a if it hits perfect, they except, will. Look, except for Jonathan again. Take for John from the New Orleans. Well, I mean, I'm saying like if he sees it's those conditions, he's going to do everything he can do to get out in the woods that day. Yeah. Not that oh the the overhead is at one o'clock. I'm not going to go mm-hmm. because it doesn't line up with that hour. Like he doesn't cancel hunts based on moon phase, but maybe he tries a little bit harder to hunt certain days based on moon phase. Mm-hmm. That's what I gathered at yep. least. And pretty much everybody that we talk to about moon phase does the same thing. Rick Cope's a little bit different because he might hunt a different area based on a different moon phase. Yeah, because he was talking about, you know, if it doesn't line up right, he's going to go hunt a clear cut. If it lines up great, you know. Then he'll hunt a feed tree. He'll hunt feed trees. Yeah. So, anyways, that's a that's a rabbit hole. Um, all right, last question. This is from Lee Franklin from North Carolina. He said, I have always been taught growing up that deer will not move in windy conditions because they can't see movement as well. I find myself not hunting in the wind, not hunting if the wind is blowing due to this teaching. What are your thoughts and experiences with this? Am I missing out on hunting days that I should actually be hunting? I say yes, you are. 
because uh, if you have like a high wind day, there's going to be somewhere where the wind is not blowing that hard, yep. whether it be like behind a hill or in a pine thicket, like something that, that breaks the wind really well. And I think they move in areas like that. At least that's where I've had luck in yeah. the past is, you know, you get on the back side of that steep ridge and it's really, really calm. Mm -hmm. Or you get on the downwind side of that pine thicket mm -hmm. and you got that really high stem count, thick cover that that wind hits and it's just slowing down as it moves through that. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere in there, I think Pike actually talked about uh, years ago on a hunting club, he put a bunch of cameras in a pine thicket. And those cameras only lit up in that specific pine thicket when it was like really windy or like a thunderstorm was coming in or something mm -hmm. because the deer selected for that cover when that weather condition happened. So that's my school of thought. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the first buck I killed this year was during very high winds, high pressure was rolling in after a storm came through. And uh, it was still raining and all that. It was still like raining off and on that day, but it was really, really high winds. Let's say high winds, like gusting over 20, 25 miles an hour. And uh, I got down a drainage on the downwind side of a ridge, and uh, that's where I rattled that buck in. Because if you were anywhere else, you couldn't hear anything. And it, it still was loud down there, but it wasn't nearly as bad as if you got higher up on the ridges. Um, so, I mean, and also I'll say this. Anytime you're not in the woods, you're definitely not going to kill a deer unless you hit him with your truck. Okay? <laughs> so that's another thing. You know, if you have the time to hunt, don't not go hunting um because like the wind you know get you some good windproof gear and you know suck it up and you know find you a spot where uh, i'll say this high wind conditions you ain't gonna catch me sitting on a clear cut oh that's miserable yeah that's <laughs> miserable i did it i did it last actually during the yeah. iron bowl last yeah. year yeah. Well, which was a better choice than sitting and watching the iron Bowl this year uh i was i uh, dude i was sitting on this huge clear cut and it was like there was a storm rolling in and it was just like winds whipping all over the place mm -hmm. And it was miserable. Well, it was like staring into an industrial fan in front of a refrigerator. It, it was like so cold, but also all that crap's whipping around in there. You can't see. You can't see anything. But I'm like sitting there looking at. It, I'm like, if I'm a deer and I'm walking through this, I'm just getting like punched in the face. Yeah, by stuff. By stuff. Well, also when we were in Arkansas, um, one of those days, uh, it was real windy, and uh, you were sitting on the edge of one of those overgrown fields. Oh, that sucks. And we we're getting pounded by the wind, and like we were back in the woods. Me and Matthew were back in the woods, and it was like. It was breezy, but it wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. But, like, you were just, like, exposed. So, like, if you're exposed, the deer's exposed, they're probably not going to want to be in that kind of stuff at that time. Yeah. So, like, definitely, you know, anything you can find as a windbreak, I think, would play, like, a bigger factor for you. You know, whether it's a hill, whether it's thicker cover, you know, just a lot of trees in between you and the wind, like, the wind direction, stuff like that, I think, you know, you're going to find better movement in those areas. And even Michael Perry's yeah. talked about, like, those really high wind days. In a lot of places that he hunts, he sees really good buck movement some of those days. Yeah, I've but, heard that from several people. Mm -hmm. Like, And our, one of our buddies, uh, Zach White, he was hunting the mountains in North Carolina the other day, and he killed his target buck, big 11 point. Um, and he FaceTimed us when he shot it. And as he was walking down to it, he mentioned that he was on. it was like 20-mile-an-hour winds that day up in the mountains. And where he shot this buck, he's on the backside of a ridge, and it was like dead calm. Yeah. Because that wind, that ridge was just completely blocking that wind. So you can find places like that. That's what I would do. Like every time I've sat in the wind on a really windy day, I haven't seen anything and I've been miserable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you can go find somewhere outside of the wind where you're still in good cover, yeah, I feel like you got a really Hit, good chance. In hill country, you're using more like the terrain to like block the wind if it's in flat land you're using vegetation to block the wind yeah so just think of it that that those two ways so whether you hunt flat land you're going to use you know trees and thick cover to block the wind you're going to get downwind of that if you're you know in hill country get on the back side of one of those ridges uh downwind side and uh and keying on that and you'll have a lot more enjoyable hunt for yeah. sure and probably see and probably actually see some deer all right um here we go. We got some reviews. Yep. So appreciate everybody Up first. Appreciate everybody leaving us new reviews. Uh, so these are reviews we try to read off on Apple Podcasts. So currently sitting at one thousand and ninety reviews. So appreciate that, everybody. Um, this is from <laughs> Gaynor's Papa. I guess is how you say their name. Uh, five stars. Titled Smart. Quality information on native plants and their importance in game management. Mm -hmm. So he's probably mentioned Sweet. some episodes we've done with Alan Summerford and then also um, Kyle uh, Ibarger, yep. which are some great episodes. All right. Um, this is uh, Love the Show, five stars from Big Rig Peasant. <laughs> uh, hey, guys. My name's Kyle. I'm new to Alabama. Judging by where you guys talk, I'm not too far from y'all. 
I moved from Florida, and these hills are a big change, but after listening to y'all for several years on terrain, I was able to get on sign and get pictures of some great bucks on public land. Now just all put it together and kill one. Keep up the great work. Oh, and life hack on rattling antlers. Use two of the same side antlers, and brows won't be a problem anymore. Interesting. I've I haven't seen, tried that before. I've seen, I've seen people do that. I feel like it'd be kind of weird. I don't know. I gotta go saw the brow tine off that antler that uh that you used yeah. to kill your buck because I tried rattling with him the other day and I freaking tore myself up. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So this is a um, uh, great podcast. Five stars from Dogwood Fifty Three. Very informative and entertaining. By the way, I appreciate you giving me the short reviews, man. I, I can read those. <laughs> well, I'm looking out for you today. Yep. Uh, cool. Uh, anything else we got? Yeah. Uh, appreciate everybody buying all the hats. So we got all the new hats uh, sitting here. Again, we mentioned this, but the old school camo hat and the chocolate chip brown on brown patch hat, both are back in stock. Dude, this camo hat, we got, we just ordered a whole bunch of them, and we got not very many left yeah, already. Yeah, so if you want one of these camo hats, you better order them before they're gone because they're going to be gone probably within the next week or so. Uh, same thing with these uh, chocolate chip hats. So appreciate everybody been buying all the new hats. Uh, appreciate all that support. It's been awesome. Also, it's been really cool seeing a lot of listener success stories come in from these you know guys wearing these hats. And like we had uh, mentioned in the past, we had some blaze orange hats. These actually, uh, if you're on YouTube, you can see this. Uh, these actually uh, sold out like a week ago. We got more on uh, we, the way. We got more on the way, but again, when they come back in stock, you better get one because first off, these are the lucky hats. Pretty much everybody's been buying these hats, been killing crap out <laughs> here. The same with uh, me and Andrew as well. So uh, hopefully, they'll be back in stock sometime mid December. So order some when they come back in stock, so you don't miss out. And hey, you know if you're in Alabama, we got a lot of long gun season left, along with Mississippi as well. Um, so just appreciate everybody's support purchasing all the new merchandise, uh, and appreciate everybody who's been writing in again. Like I said, with the listener success stories, they've been some really good ones come in. Recently recently and it's been awesome to kind of read those and share those with the audience but again we appreciate y'all watching on youtube appreciate y'all listening on all the podcast platforms and uh following the show and remember guys make sure you tune in for this coming monday's episode we got another really good one for you and always remember y'all stay southern